When Hank woke up, he noticed his phone showed 10 missed calls and an equal number of voicemail messages from an area code he didn't recognize. After dealing with numerous Chinese robo-marketing spam calls, he had configured his phone to send unknown numbers straight to voicemail. Usually, Beijing Betty didn't bother leaving a message. With his daughters still asleep, he decided to listen to the voicemails. That's when he found out that his wife, Randy, wasn't in Jacksonville, Florida, visiting her parents and sister for the weekend, as she had told him. Instead, she was in the burn unit of a hospital in Boulder, Colorado. He paused for a moment. His phone frequently pushed news notifications, which he generally found annoying, but hadn't taken the time to disable. Something about fires was nagging at his memory. He realized he'd seen a headline with the words, Fire and Boulder when his phone screen lit up that morning. Navigating to his home screen, he read the Newswire headline, Freak Wildfire Consumes Suburban Boulder Subdivision Overnight. Interesting. Hank would be the first to admit he wasn't always the sharpest tool in the shed, but he could think of only one reason why his wife of seven years would lie about her weekend plans. He deliberately slowed his pace. There was no need to hurry into anything. He made some coffee the girls wouldn't be awake for at least another hour. He carried the coffee over to his wife's workspace in the dining room and found her laptop. When he opened it, he realized it was now password protected with a password he didn't know. But Randy was forgetful and a bit careless, so he searched for a password written on a scrap of paper and found it buried at the bottom of the desk drawer. After gaining access, he noticed she hadn't even closed her email browsers. She had simply put her computer to sleep, relying on her new password and apparently confident that Hank wouldn't invade her privacy. All the assumptions that existed in this family before this morning are no longer valid, Hank thought. There it was, plainly obvious. She was planning to meet up with her old college boyfriend, Josh Turner, at his home in Boulder on a weekend when Josh's wife would be away. This was the guy who had broken Randy's heart by falling in love with the woman who became his wife, but it seemed he had developed regrets over the years. The emails didn't contain much detail, mostly just confirmations of arrival times. Hank assumed they had shared their deeper feelings over the phone. An intriguing detail caught his attention. Her parents and sister were aware of the situation and had agreed to cover for her. This information wasn't in the emails, but surfaced in the still-open Facebook Messenger chats. They all felt she should have married Josh, whose family was affluent. Hank felt numb, as if he were witnessing a slow-motion car accident he couldn't tear his eyes away from. He paused to take deep breaths. If he didn't, his pesky Apple Watch would remind him it was time for mindfulness, a feature he really needed to disable. Hank knew that without calming himself, he might end up punching holes in the sheetrock walls of the house. He decided to call the hospital in Boulder. When the switchboard operator answered, he followed a hunch and asked if Josh Turner was a patient there. When prompted to state his relationship to Mr. Turner, he claimed to be a friend. The operator responded that she couldn't provide any information, which strongly suggested that Josh Turner was indeed a patient. Hank then called the number left in his voicemails. It was the direct line to the hospital admissions office. After providing his identity, a clerk informed him that Randy had been admitted with third-degree burns covering 80% of her body, including lung damage from smoke inhalation. The fire had ignited suddenly in the drought-stricken region, spread quickly due to high winds, and blocked the only escape route from the area. Over 100 homes were destroyed. I'm sorry, Hank said. That can't be my wife. She's in Jacksonville, Florida. You must have the wrong information. He hung up the phone. Deep down, he knew she was in Boulder now. He could sense it, but he wasn't going to make things easy for anyone. He revisited his wife's computer and found Josh's Facebook page. Randy had actually added him as a friend. This made it easy to see Josh's friends and family, leading him to discover Josh's wife. She had publicly posted from her family's home in San Diego, asking for prayers after learning her husband was hospitalized with severe burns in Boulder. Time to get those prayers answered by a god of vengeance, Hank thought, 
as he reached out to Josh's wife on Facebook Messenger to introduce himself and share his discoveries, leaving his phone number. Shortly after he finished his coffee, he noticed another notification on his phone indicating a missed call. The number wasn't familiar, but there was a voicemail. It was from Josh's wife, Tina. Hank decided to call her back. Ms. Turner? Is your first name actually Tina? He asked. Yes, she sighed. I knew what I was getting into with the name when I got married, but I did it for love. It's just an icebreaker now. You must be Randy's husband. That's right. I was aware of her when Josh and I got together. He's been acting oddly lately, but I never knew why. Now it all makes sense. Is that what's happening with you? Sort of. I knew about Josh, but Randy didn't seem to be acting differently. At least not that I noticed. You're handling this calmly, Hank. How are you managing? My phone keeps reminding me to practice mindfulness and take deep breaths. I don't even want to check what it says about my heart rate. Tina chuckled. You sound calm yourself, he noted. I'm on some pills, Tina admitted. Not sure what they are. My sister gave them to me. Josh is badly burned. They've put him in a medically induced coma and he might not make it. I broke down when I heard. Now I'm just in shock, especially after learning the truth about what really happened. What's going on with your wife? She's badly burned too. That's all I know. I told them it couldn't be her because she's supposed to be in Florida. Tina chuckled again. Oh, the hospital is calling me back. I need to take this. Let's stay in touch. She hung up and Hank saved her number so his spam blocker wouldn't send her calls to voicemail. Another call came in, this time from Randy's father, Bob. He must have seen the news and gotten worried. Hello? Hank? Yes? There was a brief silence. Bob had never been fond of Hank, and Hank had reciprocated those feelings once he understood where he stood with Bob. However, they had always maintained a thin veneer of polite interaction, which Bob now noticed was absent. Hank, have you heard from Randy? Hank hesitated. That question must have cost Bob dearly, morally speaking. Why would I hear from her without you knowing? Isn't she up in her old room? Spending time with you, that shrew of a wife of yours, and your other twat daughter. Bob realized that Hank knew. He sighed. Hank, she does love you. I know we've never seen eye to eye. Bob, Hank interrupted, his voice rising. That's ridiculous. Before you continue and irritate me further, let's get something straight. You've always disliked me. I suppose you never thought I was worthy of your daughter, but Josh was. Your wife and other daughter have both been extremely rude to me as well. I've put up with it to keep the peace, but that's over now. Let me make myself clear. I'm done tolerating your disrespect. So, I'm cutting ties with you and your deceitful family, you miserable people. Hank ended the call. There was nothing more to discuss. To save himself some trouble, he blocked Bob's phone numbers, along with those of his mother-in-law and sister-in-law. Why were you shouting, Daddy? His daughter Nicole asked as she walked into the kitchen with her younger sister, Rebecca, trailing behind. Daddy said a bad word, Rebecca proclaimed. He did? Nicole responded. Say it again, Daddy. I didn't catch it. Hank couldn't help but smile. What was the bad word, Becky? He inquired. She furrowed her brow. I can't remember, she confessed. I think you might have misheard. Now let's get some breakfast. Today was going to be a pancake day. After the girls each had three pancakes and some orange juice, they sat down to watch cartoons. It was Saturday morning, after all. They were fans of Bubble Guppies. Hank hoped these shows would be a stepping stone to more substantial cartoons like Pinky and the Brain or Phineas and Ferb. The phone rang again. It was Tina Turner. The pills aren't doing anything, she said. What do you mean? The calming pills I told you about, the ones my sister gave me, they aren't working. Why do you say that, Miss Tina Turner? The hospital connected me to Josh in intensive care. The nurse put me on speakerphone thinking it might help if Josh heard my voice, even though he's in a coma. What happened? I lost my temper. I shouted that his girlfriend is also severely burned and might not survive, 
and that it's his fault. I told him that once you and I receive our life insurance payouts, we're going on a round-the-world cruise and spending the whole time making love as revenge. He nearly went into cardiac arrest after hearing me. Even though he's in a coma? Yes. Hard to tell if my yelling caused it or if it was just a coincidence. But he pulled through. Sorry. She paused. Sorry for what? Are you sorry that he almost went into cardiac arrest or sorry that he's still alive? Hank felt the urge to be harsh but held himself back. I'm just sorry about all of this, he said. Me too, she agreed. After a moment's silence, he asked, So, tell me about this cruise we're taking. Sorry, I'm not sure why I brought that up, she replied. But I'm interested, he insisted. I thought you might be, she said with a pause. Are you really interested, Hank? she asked. He responded, I noticed on Facebook that you're quite pretty, but I didn't get around to thoroughly looking through your profile. If I were to spend time getting back at someone, you'd be a great choice. Why do you ask? Do I have a chance? I'm not sure, she said slowly. It's just that ever since I found out he was cheating, I've been wondering what's wrong with me. Knowing you're interested makes me feel a bit better. And honestly, you're not bad looking yourself. Hank let out a snort. Thank you. It's good to hear, even if my wife clearly favored your husband. Maybe the issue isn't with us. That might be true. Tina Turner hesitated once more. Have you ever considered why they did it? I suppose they thought they could have relationships outside their marriage without any repercussions. That makes it sound so straightforward. What else could there be? With a tone of finality, Tina said, Listen, we both have a lot to process, but let's keep in touch. We're the only ones who truly understand how the other feels right now. All right, fair enough. I need to go buy some Bermuda shorts on Amazon for the cruise. And a Speedo swimsuit because if you've got it, might as well flaunt it. She chuckled. At least you're making me feel better. Maybe the pills are kicking in. Make sure you get a cabin with a balcony. She laughed again. Bye. They ended the call. Hank noticed he had another voicemail. It was the hospital again. He called back and was connected to a nurse in Randy's room. This nurse also put the call on speakerphone. It must be a different nurse from the one caring for Josh, but they all seemed to be following the same protocol. He wondered if that was standard practice in the industry. Mr. Henry Becker? Yes. I'm Nurse Young. You're on speakerphone right now. I'm in the hospital's intensive care burn unit. Your wife is here. She's severely burned and in a medically induced coma. She's right beside me. We were hoping the sound of your voice might help even if she's not conscious. Hank couldn't help but think that the hospital would need to revise its family outreach procedures after today, but he still had to ask. Why do you think that? I wasn't there when they brought her in. One of my friends was. She said your wife clung to her arm with a death grip and wouldn't let go until she understood her message, which was, call husband, so sorry. She fought the medical team with every ounce of strength she had, refusing to let them do anything until they promised to deliver the message. Too little. Too late, Hank thought. What am I supposed to say? Tell her what's in your heart, the nurse said, a bit too innocently. All right, Hank thought. Let's do this. Listen, you miserable, cheating piece of trash, he shouted into the phone at his wife. I hope you die in agony and rot in hell with Josh, who's going to die too. And just so you know, I'm going to use all the life insurance money I get when you're gone to seduce Josh's wife, and I will never forgive you. The call abruptly ended. It seemed the nurse hadn't been paying attention when he started speaking, but had regained her focus. Hank realized that, at this pace, he wasn't going to achieve his mindfulness objectives. Someday he'd probably feel guilty about everything he'd said, but today wasn't that day. Daddy, what does a seduce mean? Becky asked, hugging her teddy bear. Kids are always listening. Oh, it means to lead someone off the right path, he explained. 
She pondered that thoughtfully. When is mommy coming home? This was what truly angered him, having to tell his daughters what was going on. He knew he'd have to handle that carefully, but he wasn't in the mood right now. As soon as she can, Bex, he replied. Becky headed back to the living room. Hank watched her flop down in front of the television. There was no way he was taking the girls to Colorado to visit their mother in the hospital, wrapped up in bandages like a mummy. He'd rather deal with their confusion than let them have that kind of memory. That settled it for him. Half an hour later, Hank had secured tickets for a week-long stay at Disney World, booked a room at one of the on-site hotels, and purchased plane tickets. They were leaving the next morning. Nicole would miss some kindergarten, but that couldn't be helped. Just after he finalized the tickets, the hospital called back. Randy had suffered a heart attack and died. All efforts to save her had failed. Hank asked about the time of death. It was right around when he had yelled at her. He considered suggesting to Tina that she try shouting more at Josh to see if she'd have better luck pushing him over the edge. Maybe she just needed to be more passionate. Then again, he'd let her figure it out. Hank eventually had to send Randy's health insurance information to the hospital to obtain the death documents. He contacted a local mortician to arrange her cremation. Given her burns, Hank thought he might get a discount, but they told him they'd still charge the full price. He asked them to FedEx the ashes to him after he got back from Disney. Upon arrival, the girls felt sad that their mother wasn't with them. However, with enough sweets and princess makeovers at the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique, they managed to get through it. Josh held on until Thursday. Tina hadn't yelled at him again, which perhaps helped him linger. Back in Colorado, she was staying with friends because her house was gone. She told Hank she was acting as the noble widow for her children's sake. She hadn't informed them about Randy. Tina's children were older than Hank's and knew their father had been injured in the fire, making it harder to ignore. Hank's kids were unaware, and he intended to keep it that way for a while. Refraining from saying anything negative about their mother would be challenging. Shortly after returning from Florida, a FedEx courier arrived with two items requiring signatures. One was a letter from his in-laws, the other was a box containing Randy's ashes. The letter requested her remains so they could organize a memorial service and burial in her hometown in Florida, if Hank didn't want to arrange something locally. He realized they must have been making inquiries. The lack of any apology for covering up for Randy made his next decision easy. He arranged for a local teenager to babysit and provided the girls with a detailed recap of their Disney trip, complete with all the souvenirs and photos on the iPad for the sitter. Hank then drove to a nearby national park. With Randy's ashes packed in a bag over his shoulder, he hiked to one of the park's more primitive areas, which featured deep, cinderblock latrines instead of regular bathrooms. He recorded himself dumping the ashes into one of these latrines. Coincidentally, he also needed to relieve himself. As he walked back to his car, he contemplated whether therapy might be a good idea, but realized he wasn't angry anymore, at least not enough to harm anyone. Tarnishing reputations was another matter. He went ahead and posted the video on Facebook, along with an explanation of his actions. Later, he wondered if the National Park Service might issue him a fine for contaminating the cesspool. If they did, he'd be more than willing to pay. He didn't reach out to his in-laws, but noticed in the newspaper that they held a celebration of life service in Jacksonville, without including him or his daughters. He told the girls that their mother had an accident while she was away and wouldn't be coming back. They reacted as he expected. Thankfully, their daycare and kindergarten teachers were wonderful and provided much-needed support. The life insurance payout was substantial. Randy had more coverage than Hank had realized. This financial windfall made it easier for him to adjust his work life. He decided his daughters needed plenty of fresh air, especially at playgrounds bustling with other kids and attractive young mothers who were often sympathetic to his tragic story when he subtly encouraged them to ask. He left out the part about Randy's infidelity. He wanted to seem sympathetic, not pathetic. His children began receiving numerous invitations to playdates, 
where the moms would invite their single, attractive friends. Hank started to see a promising path forward. Hank never ended up with Tina Turner, although they did chat on the phone from time to time.